Hi everyone, it's MJ, the fellow actuary, and in this video, I want to talk about lions, dragons, and regulation. Now, at first, you might be wondering, why do I want to talk about an animal, a mythological creature, and probably the most boring part of the actuarial syllabus? And I guess it's a way to turn this very dry topic into something a bit more, more fun, because whether we like it or not, regulation is critical for, for actuaries. In fact, it's the reason why our profession is so powerful, because regulation says that you need a statutory actuary to sign off on insurance reserves. So without regulations, you wouldn't really have the actuarial society at its strength that it is today. But also without regulations, you wouldn't really even have a financial system because it is something that depends primarily on, on trust and cooperation. And you do need some rules um, and bylaws to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So regulation is good. But what we're going to see, and we're going to be talking about this with regards to this lion and dragon thing, is we're going to also see that regulation after a while starts to stagnate and actually becomes bad. It starts to become a barrier of entry. It stifles innovation. It starts becoming really, really expensive. There's this huge compliance burden. And what we want to try and maybe see is, is there a better way to do regulation? Now, I made a video I think it must have been what 20, 2016 so I think 2016 2017 so quite a while ago on saying that I, I brought up called the regulation cycle and the whole idea of that video was to say that regulations need to constantly be updated we should look at old rules and say mm, do we still need this and either replace them or, or remove them completely where instead what we're simply doing at the moment is we just add on rules. It's just like putting on bandage after bandage after bandage whenever there's a, a chaotic event. So for instance, we had the, the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009, and we simply added on more rules. And it was because people were getting a little bit strangled with the current rules that they created these credit default swaps, which technically aren't swaps, it's more like insurance, uh, but there was so much heavy regulation around insurance that they rather wanted to refer to it as this derivative instrument um, but then it didn't have the protection of that and it caused all the financial chaos. So what I want to do in this video is is take a lot of steps back. I want to take all a bunch like almost like a hundred years back, maybe even further, and look towards Friedrich Nietzsche. So Nietzsche wrote a book called Thus Spoke Zarathustra, and I'm currently reading a seminar given on this book by Carl Jung, where he kind of tries to address or, or or help interpret it because Nietzsche Nietzsche is a bit of a tricky, tricky character to, to interpret. But essentially, Nietzsche refers to this idea that regulations can turn into a dragon, a terrible dragon that forces us to do things, not because we want to, but because it's become all powerful and it tells us this is the way it's supposed to be done. So he refers to his dragon as thou shalt. And Nietzsche, being a very big intellectual and probably the only person capable of doing this, takes on the morality of the Ten Commandments. Now, as we know, the Ten Commandments are a cornerstone of civilization. They help people get along. And a lot of the rules that they implemented are, are common sense. You know, don't kill, don't steal, uh, don't be jealous of other people's things. You know, these things really help us to, to live together. Um, but of course, what we know is that it wasn't just Ten Commandments. You read the book of Leviticus and lots and lots and lots of other rules start getting put into place. And the system becomes very much like a dragon where people are forced to do things or live in certain ways because this is how society deems that it has to be done. And that's why Jesus comes in and it's, it's weird because the Bible refers to him like a, a lion, the lion of Judah. And, and Nietzsche it says, where the dragon says, thou shalt, um, the lion is very much, I will. So where the dragon morality is based on, these are the rules you do as I tell you, the lion morality is, I'm going to do this because I want to. I've got the freedom and the responsibility to choose to do the right thing, not because I'm being forced, but because I'm a good person and this is what I want to do. So, of course, Jesus comes in and we know um, in the Gospels that he heals people on the Sabbath and he says it's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but what comes out. And he challenges a lot of the, the dragon morality that religion had, had started to, to form. Of course, 
Jesus was was 2,000 years ago. And over time, we see that the the Christian church started becoming more and more of a a dragon in the way that it had these various rules and started introducing these new things. And so you would have other lions popping up, uh, most notably uh, Martin Luther, who then challenged the, the Catholic Church, you know, with various things like, oh, the Pope doesn't have absolute power and all these other things. But we would see that Luther himself would get challenged again by that Swiss reformer, whose name I'm probably going to mispronounce, Zwingli, which is kind of what a lot of the American and, and African Christianity is is based on, on some of his things, where he kind of challenged more of Luther's things. Anyway, we're not going to get too much into uh, Christian dogma, but the idea was that you have these set of rules, they're really beneficial for a society, but over time they start to strangle the society. It's almost like they're this form of order and they keep all this chaos away, but by keeping all the chaos away, you're keeping away, think of it maybe as as, as water. So you've got this crazy river rushing through and you can't actually access the river because it's just so chaotic. So you build a dam uh, to keep the water stale, you know, and now you can actually use the water, it's very beneficial. But if you don't allow a little bit of movement in the water, if you don't allow that circulation, that water is going to become stagnant, it's going to become a swamp, there's going to be mosquitoes, and it's not going to be very, very nice. So we see this happening with religion. Of course, with religion, it takes thousands of years for these standing bodies of water to become uh, stagnant and, I guess, a little bit polluted. And we see that uh, Nietzsche, one of his most famous comments was that God is dead or, you know, he challenged, I guess, the authority of the church. And the world was becoming more, more secularized because they were moving away from this dragon morality that the church had, had imposed towards the, the late 19th century. And kind of like the collective consciousness had moved away from it because it just was, I mean, no one likes the dragon. And away from it, we didn't really have a new set of morality to, to replace it. I think Nietzsche himself saw himself as, as a bit of the lion um, with his book Zarathustra. Almost, I guess, he wanted to replace God with his own version of morality. Um, unfortunately, Nietzsche went mad and people completely, or a bunch of people, disregarded a lot of what he said. And we see that the world then suffered two major world wars. So, because suddenly, I mean, one of the basic tenets of Christianity is that humanity is built in the image of, of God and therefore life is, is sacred. You then have Nazi Germany and they're like, well, we're, if God is dead, then man's not created in any image and we can now desecrate that and we can you know, commit all these crimes against humanity. And no one liked that. That was very, very bad time for humanity. So you see the United Nations was kind of set up and, and try to restore a little bit of order by giving us all these rights and indirectly going back towards some of the, the pre-Christian uh, values. And the reason why I bring this up is because, like I said, Nietzsche was talking about it a lot with regards to, to religion and regulation and religion kind of go hand in hand. But finance is a relatively new thing in, in humanity, and we haven't really learned too much. or We haven't taken the lessons from our religious experiences and applied it to this financial system. So with finance, we've just kept on adding more and more rules. As soon as something someone finds a loophole or there's a, a break in the rules, we just add on more rules, add on more rules, add on more rules. And what we're seeing is the financial system right now is turning into this this dragon. So even when it, let's say, comes to investing for, let's say, a pension fund. So as an actuary, you're designing the investment strategy. You don't really have a lot of, of leeway or choice on what to do. It's kind of like it's almost become prescribed, like, OK, 60 percent has to go into bonds. 35 percent has to go into to equity and 5 percent you can maybe play around with. And 20 percent has to be, um, you know, uh, overseas and so much has to be here and it becomes very very prescriptive about what you have to have to do and like I say it's become very much like a a dragon you know the financial system it's all about what you can't do and what you can do and these are the rules and I think this is why we've got this this lion that has emerged in the in the shape of of crypto um, and why people are embracing Bitcoin are embracing Ethereum are embracing the, the blockchain is because they kind of see it as 
the financial system is too strangling, it's too suffocating, where we can come to this new system where there aren't any rules and we can do whatever we want. And of course, that is, that's a lot of fun, there's a lot of innovation, a lot of crazy decentralized applications have been built for financial things. But of course, the lion, what we know from uh, <laughs> from our storybooks is that the lion is also quite a dangerous animal. Like it will eat you if you do not tame it. And we are seeing these massive Ponzi schemes. We are seeing all these scandals that are happening without regulation. So crypto has allowed for a lot of innovation, but also a lot of people have have lost their hard earned money um, because there are a bunch of cheats and Ponzi schemes and scams and all these, these horrible things. So where this kind of leads us is we almost need to, I guess as, as actuaries, is we need to be joining this conversation when new rules and regulations are, are introduced into the financial system. And I think we also need to start putting a little bit of pressure on the rules that are bad. So rules that are, are suffocating or, or preventing things from going forward, actuaries need to be part of that conversation to say, hey, is this rule getting set up to just strengthen the establishment um, or is it really being designed to, to prevent another scam from, from taking place? Because you can imagine if you're a very, very big company and you already have everything established, you kind of want to ride the dragon because if you've got, let's say, an insurance company and you set up a rule saying in order to start a new insurance company, you need a significant amount of capital, then you basically don't have to worry about any startup or app or anything that can pop up at the grassroots level because they just can't access that amount of capital. And you can justify it by saying, mm, it's very good that we have more and more reserves to protect the policy holder. Meanwhile, this rule has got a bit of a double edge in the sense that it's designed primarily to, to keep competition away. So basically, I guess to, to maybe sum up this, this rather weird video, um, we need to be conscious that the financial system doesn't become too much, or I guess it really is a dragon. So we need to say, hold on, if the current financial system, oh, did I push the wrong button there? Sorry, I hope I'm back. I pushed the wrong <laughs> But yeah, I guess, guess Ed, in conclusion, as the financial system, we need to start thinking to ourselves, are the current rules and regulations that we have in place beneficial for the system as a whole, or is it just benefiting the top participants? Because if it is only benefiting the top participants, then what we're going to see is people are going to try and rebel and become a lion to the system, embrace crypto, and we could see two competing systems moving forward. So the best way for the financial system to, to respond to crypto, I would say, is not to try and regulate crypto and bring in rules and try hitting the exchange exchanges and KYC and tax and all these kind of things which they're going towards, I think instead the current uh, regulation system should look back at itself and say, hmm, how do we compete with this existing system? How do we make our rules more efficient? And basically having the strength to say, because I guess you could almost look at it like coming back to the Catholic Church, is you had some people like um, Erasmus who was very much negative towards Luther and saying, no, you know, let's rather have the Reformation from within the Catholic Church. Let's rather change the things within rather than breaking out and forming the, the Protestant movement. And Luther was like, well, that's not really going to happen with the current people in power because these rules are benefiting them tremendously. You know, the, the Cardinale and all these kind of people who were in there for the wrong reasons were not going to just give up their power. And I guess that kind of contributes to the whole dragon um, kind of morality that, that Nietzsche kind of saw. So it's a very, very tricky situation that, that we find ourselves in. It's because, yes, we, there are some rules that we would love to change. We would love to, to relax and, and allow for more innovation in the existing financial system. But the big power parties, uh, the big participants, are not going to, to let them uh, be changed without a fight. And that means that people are going to be looking to building things rather in the, the blockchain and the, the crypto universe rather than in the existing space. But like I said, this is just me thinking out loud. I mean, I literally, I've just minted the piece on, on Super Rare as, as an NFT. If I can, I'll try to pop it up and you guys can have a, have a look at what it is and give a link if you can go check it out on Super Rare. Um, but I was just, yeah, like I said, I was reading this book on, on Nietzsche, talking about these different forms of morality. I was thinking about it 
And then I was like, wait, that's, that's very similar to what's happening in, in the financial system. But as always, I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments on this topic. And yeah, let me know what I should chat about next. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you all soon. Cheers.